Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure being with you here this morning. Uh, this, the Australian Climate Commission has worked with the AMA uh, on a number of occasions, but particularly in producing our report on health impacts of climate change, and there's copies of that report available at the front desk um, for you this morning. I just want to talk very briefly about the Climate Commission because um, there's quite a bit of misunderstanding about what we do. We are, we are set up as a result of a promise by the Gillard government uh, uh, and uh, started our work in February 2011. We're an independent authority, so we don't report to the minister. We're independent of government. And our brief is a very narrow one. We are, our role is to engage the Australian public in a discussion about climate change, um, the science, the economic options that are being pursued, and uh, the, uh, what's happening internationally in terms of action. We don't comment on government policy nor opposition policy because that muddies the water for us. We want to be seen as an authoritative source of information and in order to achieve that we give away the power to comment on government policy because that would turn us into party political animals which we are most definitely not. So we're basically an educational function. We get out there, have town hall meetings, meet with business people, meet with groups like this and lead a discussion on um, uh, what's happening in the climate change space and let people then make up their own minds. I want to begin with just a brief overview of climate science um, just because uh, I, I think it's very important that we, we, we see um, what the science uh, is telling us and what's agreed on. I think we can um, get this. Good. Um, the climate is undoubtedly changing. This is the long-term uh, temperature record for the, for the atmosphere for quite independent studies from around the world documenting the increasing rise in temperature, particularly since the 1950s. All in agreement, as you can see. 90% of the heat that's being trapped by the atmosphere is going into the oceans, and this is an indication of ocean warming. You see the curves much steadier because the ocean is 500 times larger than the atmosphere, um, and therefore it responds less quickly. Uh, to, to changes, including year to year changes, we get a much better smooth curve. Three major global studies showing exactly the same thing. <coughs> as, the, as the ocean and atmosphere warms, of course, the ice is melting. This is projections for ice loss across the Arctic. The, the grey band there with the black line in the middle is the, is the computer projections um, of what may be happening. The red line is actual data, and you can see in this case that the ice loss is far exceeding the computer projections and that's rather typical of, of many of the projections. This is a rather extreme example but in many cases um, the computer projections are rather conservative in what they tell us. The real world data is, um, is, is, is somewhat in advance of it. Uh, we've had a, a full decade now to, to ground truth our projections made in 2001 and consistently this is the, this is the sort of pattern we're seeing that the, the projections are conservative. Why is the atmosphere warming? Just very briefly, um, since 1859 we've understood this. The first laboratory based experiments showing that greenhouse gases trap heat were conducted in 1859, the year Darwin wrote his book on, the, on evolution. Um, and today we understand that that extra heat is being trapped by CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Sunlight comes into the atmosphere, transforms into heat when it hits the surface. Some of the heat's trapped, but effectively the greenhouse gases act like a blanket on the planet. Without them, the average surface temperature would be minus 15 degrees, so the Earth would be a frozen sphere. Um, with the greenhouse gas concentration we have, it's about plus 15 degrees. Carbon dioxide really does explain the warming that you've just seen, demonstrated. Um, just want to show what um, the models um, suggest the warming trend would be like if it was purely natural phenomena, if it was just volcanoes and just variation in sunlight we can factor that all into the models and show what should have been happening over the last century in terms of the warming trend. But if we factor in the human emitted greenhouse gases, we get a different picture. The models tell us the temperature should be rising. So then we can overlay on that the real world data that we actually see, the actual observations of temperature rise, of um, global temperature. Where does that fall? That falls, of course, right across the anthropogenic spectrum right across the, the projections that include the human factors rather than just the natural ones, giving us great faith that in fact um, we're reading this correctly, that it is your human impact that's causing the warming. The implications um, of 
the, the warming that we're looking at may seem small when we talk about one or two, three or four degrees of warming, but as you probably understand, if you shift a bell curve slightly, increase the mean, you can have large impacts. Just this example here shows you a shifted bell curve. The previous climate, we add one or two degrees of warming, we get a very large increase in extreme events because we've shifted the bell curve to the right. And this is one of the great concerns, it's one of the things we're seeing with, with heat waves and so forth, um, and in, increased uh, fire, fire intensity and so forth because we're getting more events, unprecedented events in that, that right hand side of the curve. The, the, here we're just looking at Melbourne 2009 where rail infrastructure um, was not able to uh, keep up with the increased temperatures and we had a breakdown of uh, some of the rail system. Just to give you a sense of timing uh, and what the projections are telling us, this is a graph showing us uh, the warming trend um, and two possibilities, two projections into the future. So we've got the actual warming, observed warming trend up to about uh, 2010 and then projections into the future. The blue lines tell us where we may end up if we take concerted action on climate change to reduce the human emissions. The red line tells us what the business as usual scenario looks like. I just want to overlay very roughly my um, lifespan, and you doctors are probably better at telling me this than I am, but I reckon that's about right for me. Um, and if you overlay that across the, um, the projections, you see that um, it's okay for me. I'm not going to experience the worst of the warming. But my children will, and, and this line is drawn through the average temperature that, that we'll experience during our life. So mine is pretty much uh, what we have today. My kids are significantly warmer and towards the end of the period um, increasingly difficult. But it's my grandkids that, that worry me. I haven't got any yet. I will have some, I hope, in future. But their world is the one that we are determining the shape of this decade as we deal with the climate change problem. That's all I want to show you uh, in terms of those projections. Um, I want to now just go on to have a look at what world health organisations or health organisations around the world have been saying about climate change because the, uh, there has been quite a lot of activity in this area. There's been a large number of statements and they're all consistent. So the World Health Organisation, for example, has said that the health effects of climate change are already evident and you can see that from um, our own report that we put out that in Australia we're seeing impacts already. The Lancet in 2009 said climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. The impacts will be felt all around the world, not just in some distant future, but in our lifetimes and those of our children. Again, consistent with the sort of graphics we're seeing here. The American Public Health Association has said that the long-term threat of global climate change to global health is extremely serious. And you may have seen in the paper just in the last few days projections that there may be as many as 150,000 additional deaths through heat stress in the US by the end of the century. Dr Diana Hansen, the President of the World Medical Association, has said that climate change represents an inevitable massive threat to global health that will likely eclipse the major known pandemics as the leading cause of death and disease in the 21st century. The health of the world population must be elevated in this discussion from an afterthought to a central theme around which decision makers construct rational, well-informed and action-oriented climate change strategies. And those ch strategies, of course, have to include both mitigation, so avoiding the problem that we're seeing here, but also adapting to a certain amount of inevitable warming. So we need to have our medical systems prepared uh, to deal with the challenges uh, that, will, that will inevitably arise over, uh, over uh, coming decades. I think one of the problems we face when we deal with this issue is that heat and heat waves is a bit of a silent killer. It doesn't grab the headlines. I remember in Victoria in 2009 when that huge heat wave hit and we had the bushfires. Uh, uh, after that, I think around about 170 people uh, died in those bushfires. But in the few days preceding the bushfires, more than 300 people died of heat-related causes. Uh, and that didn't seem to make the headlines. So somehow as a society, we see the crisis, you know, the, the, the immediate impact, but we don't see uh, the silent killer that, that um, is increasing uh, decade by decade around the world. There are also, of course, implications for infectious diseases. Um, we won't see uniform rises in, in infectious diseases, but uh, 
I just remember I, I, I'm about to go to India to attend a, a meeting of Tata Power and looked at the travel advisory. It said during the wet season when things are hot in India, expect to get sick. You can, you know, the chances of food contamination, of water contamination and so forth rise with increasing temperatures. So those sort of things are a concern. Um, dengue fever is another very clear-cut example where uh, there is a threat from rising temperatures. It's a, it's a, a, a arbovirus, it's, it's an arthropod-borne virus um, spread by insects. As conditions change, the mosquitoes that spread the disease are projected to move further south and we're already seeing globally some expansion of uh, the range of dengue fever as the planet warms. It's important to understand as well, I think, that it's the most vulnerable members of our community that will be hardest hit by climate change. The elderly, the young, people with chronic illnesses, those in lower socioeconomic groups and, and, and particularly Indigenous communities, I think are at special risk. They're the ones who are least able to defend themselves from one reason or another from the extremes of climate and, and weather, which we'll be seeing in future. What's true for Australia, of course, is true worldwide as well. The World Health Organisation estimates that, that, that since global warming, well, since the 1970s, global warming has been causing about 140,000 excess deaths annually um, by the year 2004. And the major killers, of course, diarrheal disease, malnutrition, malaria and dengue are highly climate sensitive and that situation is expected to worsen as time goes on. I think it's important as well to understand that in addressing climate change we can build a healthier Australia. The old fossil fuel based economy uh, has a number of sources of pollution which are unrelated to climate change uh, but which need to be dealt with. For example, between a third and a half of the mercury uh, that, uh, that enters human bodies these days comes from the burning of coal. Coal is, of course, a sponge um, in the ground. Anything that's mobile in groundwater will tend to accumulate in the sponge, and when we burn uh, that coal, we tend to liberate uh, those elements. And the, the, the progression of mercury is a very interesting one because you know, we dig it up in coal from deep under the ground, we put it through a coal-fired power plant, it gets into the atmosphere, it then blows way up, towards the stratospheric boundary across the ocean. The atmosphere then falls to the surface of the ocean, or the mercury, sorry, falls to the surface of the ocean where it's immediately absorbed because it's a catalyst for a lot of metabolic reactions by microscopic organisms at the surface of the ocean. They're eaten by vertical migrating organisms that carry the mercury within a week right down into the depths of the ocean. There it becomes methylated, becomes the active form that can uh, absorb, be absorbed by our bodies very aggressively. And then a fish absorbs that mercury by eating those vertical migrators. A fisherman comes along, catches a fish, puts it onto your dinner plate. So within a few weeks or perhaps a few months of being dug from the bowels of the, the earth, it's gone into the upper atmosphere, it's gone into the oceans, it's gone into the abyssal depths and ended up on your dinner plate. It's a good example of global impacts from, uh, from some of our human activities. So as we shift to a clean energy economy, there are additional health benefits to be had, particularly in places like uh, the developing world. If you've ever been to China, you'll know the impacts of coal burning on air quality uh, across the country. I'd just like to say that as the climate debate's gone on in this country, there's been a degradation of respect for science. And that has been, I think, one of the most damaging aspects of this whole debate in the long term. I guess as medical experts you understand that medical therapies are based on science and that the success of therapies are never guaranteed. You always undertake a probabilistic assessment for any sort of therapy that you would recommend to someone. Some, I guess, hip replacement and so forth have a 90% or more chance of success. Well, the certainties that are depicted by climate science modelling are now equal or better in terms of probabilistic assessment than most of the, the, um, the therapies, the models you use for therapies to, de to derive your, um, your probabilities. So climate science is, a re is, um, is reliable. It's important to understand that. Um, it's probabilistic. We can ground truth it. We test our models against real world data and uh, we see uh, where there are faults and flaws, as I showed you with the Arctic ice cap, and then try to improve the models to reflect better the real world uh, situation. 
I think it's important for doctors to play an active role in this, not only because your profession is going to be directly impacted by climate change, but because doctors are among the most respected leaders that we have in our community. The AMA has already played a fantastic leading role, I think, in terms of highlighting these problems to come and understanding that we need to act to avoid climate change. Health professionals have been very active previously in issues like smoking and so forth, done a fantastic job in terms of reducing projected health impacts. I think the same can be true for climate change today. Of course, at the moment, we're in a difficult situation. The, the issue of climate change has become highly politicised. People view it as a tribal matter rather than as a scientific matter, and that makes it difficult to communicate and discuss the issue. I'm not going to say anything about government policy, but I do want to say something about costs, because part of the, the alignment of people has been around costs. And of course, to deal with a pollution problem, the polluter has to pay. You either regulate or you, you impose a cost in a market-based situation or, or you do something to make sure that the polluter uh, changes their behaviour and reduces the pollution stream. In the case of climate change, the cost that we have to pay in order to avoid these worst outcomes, and you can see up here, are effectively encapsulated in our target. And the target for our country, Australia, is to reduce our emissions by 5% below 2000 levels by 2020. Because we have a strongly growing economy and a growing population, that's a very ambitious target, because if we'd done nothing, emissions would have risen by about 25% above 2000 levels. So we're looking at a 30% cut below business as usual. It's important to understand that that commitment to the 5% reduction target is agreed by both sides of politics. Both parties support that. And it's that target that ultimately dictates costs. Of course you could have silly policies that would inflate those costs greatly, but no one's in the business of doing that. So it's the target that dictates the costs. Who pays those costs precisely? That can all be argued as well. But it's important to understand that there is a cost that, that's unavoidable and that we want to pay the least cost we can, find the right mechanism to pay the least cost and make sure that cost is distributed e equitably. That's, in my view, where the debate should be um, because uh, to have the debate in another space is, 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 is really avoiding um, serious issues that need to be dealt with um, by our society as a whole. I think there's two things that health professionals could be doing. The first, as I mentioned earlier, is to communicate. As, as trusted members of the community, assuring that the community is aware of the health risks of climate change is an important thing uh, that doctors could be doing. Doctors can also lead. There's a ripple effect when prominent institutions and members of communities demonstrate leadership. We see it all the time. For example, reducing energy consumption at a hospital or a GP clinic can inspire many people to do the same sort of things. So as you go about doing your work of making your business place more energy efficient, saving money, addressing climate change, I think it's a great idea if you can advertise it because you can really inspire people uh, to follow that lead. And of course, efficiency is one of the most important tools we have in terms of addressing this issue. Doctors for the Environment have a stall here outside today uh, there's lots of information as to what doctors can do in their clinics and I just recommend that if you're interested you go and have a look at that stall. I want to conclude just by thanking you all once again and particularly thanking the AMA for the work that you've done um, both alone and in collaboration with the Climate Commission. The importance of bodies like the AMA demonstrating leadership on issues of critical national importance can't be overstated. Um, so having said that, I will step down and I believe we're, we're having questions after the next two speakers uh, have, have had their turn. Thank you very much.